will be in English because Annie is uh, from Great Britain, not from England, she'll explain that in a minute. Um, and uh, uh, she's also my girlfriend, the name of full disclosure. Um, and she will uh, uh, talk a bit about uh, the same things that I just talked about, except she'll be talking from personal experience since she used to work for the British Secret Service um, in the 90s. <coughs> so, Annie, take it away. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, just a quick question to kick off. How many of you will admit to having watched and enjoyed Spooks? Yay, one, two, three, right? that's not bad. That's brave, socially brave. What about James Bond and the Born Ultimatum, all those sort of films? Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Enjoyed. Well, I'm going to prick that bubble. It's nothing like that when you work as a spy, of course, of course, of course. The basic role um, when you're employed as an intelligence officer for MI5 is you run operations. You basically identify what is a threat to the country, to national security, and then you have this array of different techniques by which you can investigate the threat. You can run agents into groups, obviously. You can bug their telephones, their internet, you can put bugs in their flats and homes and eavesdrop on them. You can use satellites to spy on them. You know all the techie stuff. But the problem is, there is no real oversight to these agencies. There is no effective oversight. They are a law unto themselves. And they are running a mock at the moment. So I just wanted to run you through some of the stuff that I saw when I was working on the inside which will explain why I ended up as a whistleblower against MI5 and had to go on the run from them across Europe. And also put it in a sort of current context, which is touching on some of the issues that I was talking about before. But my story starts um, quite a long time ago now. I was recruited back in 1990 to be an intelligence officer for MI5. And at that point, they were trying to reinvent themselves. In the UK, we have three agencies. We have MI5 that protects the country. We have MI6, which is a sort of James Bond organisation goes out and gathers intelligence abroad. And we have GCHQ, which eavesdrops. That's the technical side, where they uh, listen to our telephone conversations and things. So MI5 is the group that approached me. Now, I don't know why. I'd applied to be a diplomat once I came down from the university. And suddenly had a letter in the post on Ministry of Defence notepaper saying, we may have other jobs you would find more interesting. And my initial gut instinct was, fuck, it's MI5. And I was really frightened. I'd never even conceived or had an interest in being a spy. Unfortunately, um, my father was in the room with me when I opened the letter. I would have ignored it, but he was a complete spy geek. He just loved James Bond, John Le Carre, Len Dayton, the whole thing. So he said, oh, go on, go on, just please ring them up and see if it is MI5. So after about 10 months of recruitment, then there I was, walking into their HQ in London to learn to be a spy. Now, 1990 was an interesting year for them because, of course, the Berlin Wall had come down the year before. The Cold War was over. So their whole raison d'etre had pretty much vanished by that point. They were there to stop Soviet espionage, and they were there to investigate political activism in the UK. So suddenly, that whole thing had disappeared. They had also, for the first time in their 80-year existence, been put on a legal footing. So from 1909 to 1989, none of the spy agencies officially existed. They were completely off the radar. Our democratically elected representatives could not ask questions about them. Um, their whole existence was deniable, and that of course meant they could work completely outside the law as well, because nobody knew what they got up to. That changed in 1989, they were put on a legal footing, and suddenly they were expected to adhere to basic democratic law. So for example, if they wanted to break into your house, plant a bug, which would otherwise be a crime, housebreaking, they had to get permission from their political masters. And also, as I said, the Cold War was over, so they were looking for some new work, and they were repositioning themselves as a counter-terrorism organisation. So when I was being recruited, they went to great pains to say, of course, you know, the bad old days of investigating reds under the bed were over. Um, they no longer investigated left-wing political activists. They were a counter-terrorism organisation. They had to obey the law, and they wanted a new generation of intelligence officers to do the counter-terrorism work. So I thought, okay, fine. It was a 10-month recruitment process, went on for a long, long time, stage after stage after stage of intensive um, exercises and examinations and all the rest of it. And of course, because it's MI5, you think they know everything about you, so you're 110% honest when you're answering the questions, no sort of gliding over little holes in your curriculum vitae or anything. And I still kept getting through, and I was surprised all the way through. 
So by the time I got there, I thought, well, you know, perhaps I must be right for this job. Perhaps they are as they describe themselves now. They're no longer some evil, strike-breaking political organisation. So it was a bit of a surprise when I was, my first posting was announced to me. I was sent to a little section called F2, which was a hangover from the Cold War, which was there to investigate political activism in the UK. And I was assigned to look at left-wing extremist groups. Now, I have to say in my defence, I did spend those two years trying to shut down the investigations because I could not see how micro-groups with Trotskyist politics would actually affect our national security. But it gave me quite an interesting insight into the old work that they had got up to, because I saw a lot of the old files. There were about a million files held on people in the UK, UK citizens, purely for their political beliefs. And amongst those were a number of people who had political aspirations, who went on after the 1997 general election to become Labour government ministers. So MI5 had files on people from Tony Blair down. Anyone who has been anyone in British politics for the last decade pretty much had an MI5 file, usually for some sort of student activism they'd done in their radical youth. It's terribly embarrassing for them now to be reminded that they had some sort of uh, radical youth. But anyway, that was the case. And I think this is a real problem for a democracy, where you have the spies holding secret information on the people who are supposed to be running them, <coughs> their bosses, their political masters, the people who are supposed to be holding them to account. And I think every time in the UK when we see our Labour government throwing more money, more staff, more powers at the spies to fight the war on terror. It's always worth bearing that in the back of our minds. I don't know how the system works in this country, but I'm willing to bet it's pretty much the same, that your um, spy agencies will have looked at political activists and will be looking at political activists. I spent <coughs> about uh, six years in my five, and I had three postings there. So there's political stuff. Then I worked against Irish terrorism, and this was pretty much at the height of the IRA UK mainland campaign when they were putting bombs down at will on UK streets. And then I worked in the international terrorism section. Now, the Irish side was interesting and also quite rewarding. We did have some good results, you know, stopping some attacks. But there was this vast array of incompetence where terrorists were allowed to roam free and where they were exploding bombs pretty much at will, as I said, including one of the most notorious cases, which was the bombing of the City of London in 1993, and this is where a lorry bomb was driven and parked in an area called Bishopsgate. And it was about a tonne of homemade explosive. And it just detonated, killed one person, injured many more, and also caused about £350 million worth of damage, which was way more than had been caused in the whole of the civil war in Northern Ireland itself up to that date. But crucially, the terrorist who detonated that bomb should have been arrested six, month, six months earlier. He was actually caught red-handed tending another lorry bomb, which was parked up in an uh, industrial car park in the north of London. And MI5 and the police knew it was full of homemade explosive. They knew that they could go in and arrest this guy, but they had to get the order from the head of the counter-terrorism um, branch in the Metropolitan Police. And crucially, that guy was not contactable that night. This is pre-mobile phones. I mean, he did have a pager, but um, he couldn't be contact contacted. Now, rumours went round MI5 that, in fact, he was with his mistress that night, which is why he had everything switched off, but we still don't know to this day. But anyway, this guy, uh, his name was Cyril Jimmy McGuinness, the IRA terrorist, went ahead and <coughs> bombed Bishop's Gate, as I said. So you have to wonder, is it just cock-up or whatever? I think probably it was cock-up in this particular case. <laughs> um, as I said, I also worked on the international side of things. That was my final uh, posting in MI5, a section called G Branch. And this was when Al-Qaeda um, was becoming to be known, at least within the intelligence community, as the new big threat. Um, my partner, ex-partner, David Shaler, uh, who was also an officer of MI5, was working in that section at the time as well. And he was the head of the Libyan section. So he was tasked with investigating Libyan terrorists, the Libyan regime within the country, uh, what they were getting up to against Libyan distance in London. And we saw a number of things going wrong in that section that led us to decide to leave, to resign from MI5, and also to blow the whistle, which is quite a step in the UK for legal reasons. But uh, just in a nutshell, there are three cases that really worried us. The first of all was an illegal phone tapping operation. And you might think, well, they probably do that all the time. Well, yes, they do, but this was quite a high profile one, where a very prominent UK journalist called Victoria Britton, who was the uh, deputy editor of the uh, deputy foreign editor of the Guardian newspaper was targeted for six months 
And they went in and they bugged her telephone at the cost of I think about three quarters of a million pounds without any intelligence to do so. They just basically thought, great, she's a left lefty. It's like the good old days, we can go and investigate a left-wing journalist. And <laughs> wasted all this money. And crucially, they did not carry out the basic checks to that were required to make that phone tap legal under all these new laws that they had to operate within. In fact, all she was doing was fighting a legal uh, libel case on behalf of someone who had links to the Libyan regime. That was it. There was no more hardcore terrorist intelligence around this woman. But the two big cases that made us quit were two cases of <coughs> uh, false flag um, terrorist attacks. And the first one was the bombing of the Israeli embassy in London in 1994. Now, in this case, a car bomb, a very sophisticated device, was driven and parked outside the Israeli embassy, where it was exploded. Now, it was very sophisticated because it was built so that it consumed itself, and very few organisations can do that. Even the IRA, which was, again, a very, um, very developed terrorist organisation, <coughs> could not build bombs that would actually consume itself and get rid of most of the forensics. This did. Also, nobody, fortunately, was killed. There were a few minor injuries. But, uh, yeah, it was an interesting case because all the senior diplomats in the Israeli embassy were out that day against all regulation and rules within that embassy. And it turned out, in the assessment of a senior MI5 officer, and his James Bond sort of number was G91, I know who he is, turned out that in his assessment, having seen all the evidence around this case, and all the intelligence, which crucially is not necessarily admissible in court, he reckoned that Mossad had carried out the bombing itself against its own embassy in London. And now, if you read that on the internet, you think that's some wild conspiracy theory. But his thinking was twofold. The Israeli government was always pressuring MI5 to up the threat level to its interests in London. They kept saying, you know, you're full of Palestinian terrorists, they're bound to attack us one day. And MI5 kept turning around and saying, well, there's no evidence that they are going to try and attack you. We are not upping the threat level from moderate. Of course, setting off a controlled and sophisticated explosion immediately ramped up the threat. But the main thing, I think, uh, and this was G91's assessment, was that there were some Palestinians in London who were causing problems. They'd set up a political network to send aid and raise awareness about the plight of the Palestinians on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And this was an operation designed to shatter that network because a number of people involved in that political network were rounded up and arrested. And two of those people were charged, put on trial, and convicted of conspiracy <coughs> to cause those attacks. So, of course, that network just shattered, ran for the hills, and to this day has not got back on its feet. So, if G91 was accurate and, and correct about this, of course, they, would, they actually achieved a good political aim, as far as Mossad would be concerned, to get rid of an irritant in London. Now, those two people are still in prison, despite the fact that this information came out in the late 1990s, despite the fact that under all due process of the law, they should have been given an appeal. They have proclaimed their innocence ever since they were convicted, but they are both serving 20-year 20, 20 sentences, and they're still rotting in prison to this day. It's just disgraceful. But the final case I just want to brush over is um, the case, really, that made Shayla and I quit. And as I said, he was the head of the Libyan section in MI5. <coughs> And he unusually had a good working relationship with the Libyan, with his counterparts in MI6. This is a sort of James Bond wing. Normally the two groups hate each other, the two organisations loathe each other because they're competing for power and resources and status, and they do not work well together. But unusually he developed a good working relationship. So come late 1995, he went across to MI6's HQ, you know, that sort of ziggurat building you always see in the sort of spy films, and was briefed officially about an unfolding plot in Libya. Now, in this case, um, there was a volunteer, a walk-in, as they're known. It was a Libyan military intelligence officer had gone to the British Embassy in Tunis to find the local MI6 officer. They're always based in, in um, embassies, so it's very easy to find them. And he said he had a cunning plan. He wanted to talk to MI6 because he had, quote, a group of ragtag Islamic extremists in Libya who were prepared to try and effect a coup against Colonel Gaddafi. They had the people in place and they had the, the contacts as well throughout the establishment, but they needed funding to try and carry out this attack. Now, MI6, I mean, it just fell for this hook, line, and sinker. They, they carried out very few checks on this guy. 
Turned out he was a Libyan military intelligence officer. He was codenamed Tomworth by MI5. And they started shoveling money at this guy. They met him on about three different occasions in different locations around Europe. And on each occasion gave him about $40,000. So we're looking at you know, quite a sizable amount of taxpayers' money going to this organisation that was trying to carry out a terrorist attack in Libya. Anyway, Shaler was briefed on this officially all the way through the plot, but he sort of thought it wouldn't happen. MI6 were always coming up with these sort of crackpot schemes. They wanted to play at being James Bond, but they very rarely actually did the work for it effectively. So he was quite surprised when in early 1996, he started seeing intelligence reports coming across his desk, which said there had indeed been an attack. Colonel Gaddafi had been at the Libyan, Pe Libyan People's Congress in Sirte in Libya, and he was driving back in a cavalcade of cars. An explosion had occurred under one of those cars, the wrong one, obviously, because Gaddafi's now the manifestly alive and now the new best friend of all our Western leaders. But innocent people were killed in that car. And also more people were killed, bystanders, you know, cheering on their leader, in the ensuing security shootout. It's reckoned that I think 11 innocent people lost their lives that day because of the explosion that was funded by MI6. So what we're looking at is Britain and its intelligence agencies becoming a state sponsor of terrorism and blaming it on an Islamic extremist cell. We're also looking at an illegal operation because under the 1994 Intelligence Services Act in the UK, the one thing that is true about the James Bond films is the license to kill. It's a bit of a weird one, but if an MI6 officer gets the written permission before doing it, before doing something, for what would otherwise be an illegal act abroad, he gets legal immunity in the UK. So that includes up to and including murder. An MI6 officer, if he has the written permission from the Foreign Secretary, their political master, can go and do whatever he wants abroad and not face prosecution. And that's what, uh, that's what should have happened in this case, but in fact it turned out that MI6 had not got that prior written permission. So we're looking at something which you know, is immoral, it's unethical, it's highly reckless in a very volatile part of the world and it murdered innocent people, but it's illegal under UK law as well. And that's why Shayla and I resigned from MI5 and we decided to blow the whistle. And I can't really think of anything more heinous that the spies could get up to. And you would think that the government would want to take evidence about that. How naive can you be? Anyway, we left in 1996 and in the UK we have this invidious piece of law called the Official Secrets Act, which is put in place to shut up whistleblowers. There's already other laws to protect real secrets, to prosecute traitors, but in 1989 this law came in too, and it basically says that anyone who is a serving or former intelligence officer can never say anything to anyone about the work they've done in MI5 or MI6. Otherwise, they face an unlimited fine and or up to two years in prison. And we knew this, but we also knew that what we were talking about was manifestly in the public interest, which is no defence under law, but you think you get a fair hearing at least because people would want to get to the truth. So as I said, we left, and we decided to blow the whistle, and we went to the newspapers. That was the only way we could guarantee there would be publicity and it wouldn't be brushed onto the carpet. We also, though, did not want to sit around waiting to be arrested in the UK. So we set the story in motion. The newspaper decided to run with it and gave us three days warning that our lives were about to be turned upside down. And we decided, you know, we don't want to just get arrested and thrown in prison and have to wait for a trial about a year down the line, so we went on the run. In fact, we flew to Holland, sorry, the Netherlands, I must never say Holland, <laughs> it's a very British thing. We um, flew to the Netherlands, it was about the last flight out of the UK that weekend, this was in August 1997, because it was a bank holiday weekend and everyone was fleeing the country. And uh, landed in Amsterdam and went on the run around the Netherlands, moving from hotel to hotel for a week, as the story broke. And then, um, after a week and doing a couple more interviews here, we decided to get as far and as far, as far away as fast as we could, which meant getting from, I think it was The Hague, all the way down to Bayonne, which is in the far southwest of France, by train in a day. And the whole thing just went bonkers. I mean, it's a long time ago now, 1997, but this story created worldwide headlines. And we had to move fast because we knew that MI5 was hot on our trail. And we did manage to hide out for quite a long time. The first month was literally on the run, moving around, night after night, different hotels, always looking over our shoulders. We thought we'd been tracked a couple of times by the uh, surveillance branch, and we're literally prepared just to flee a hotel and go across the border to run ahead of them. And of course, it was quite interesting because we were sort of gamekeeper turned poacher. We knew roughly 
how to stay under the radar at that time and stay one step ahead. In fact, it was actually much more like being a real spy at that point than it was when we were working there. <coughs> After about a month, um, or actually during that phase as well, what had happened is they decided to raid our home in London. And uh, they sent in the special branch, which is the sort of secret police in the UK. And they rammed down the door and did a counter-terrorism style search of our flat. They had a warrant to do this, but only to take away material which related to MI5. And of course, there's nothing in our flat that related to MI5. But that didn't stop them ripping it apart. They pulled up the carpets, they pulled up the floorboards, they ripped the bath apart, they smashed up furniture. They even went into the pipes around the bath, and I don't know if they were looking for microfilm or something, shoved up the pipes, but they really ripped the place apart. They also, as well, the authorities, did an immediate reaction. They took out an injunction in the media against any further disclosures, which gagged Shayla and me, and it also gagged the national media in the UK. Now, needless to say, a few years down the line, they dropped the injunction against the national media because that could lead to big, nasty trials and uh, court hearings. But I think the injunction is still in place against Shayla, so he's a banned person. Anyway, so after a month of literally on the run, um, I knew that I had to go back to the UK. Up until that point, I'd just been sort of the girlfriend. Um, I hadn't talked about my work in MI5 at that point. So you would think, actually, I hadn't broken the law and I should be able to free move freely around my country. But of course I was arrested as I came into the country. Um, I was actually picked up at the immigration desk and they sort of hauled me off to a counter-terrorism style interview suite in the central London police station where they grilled me for about six hours. And um, it was quite intensive. It was, it was a weird experience. They were sort of reading out letters, you know, Dave and I had written each other and things like that, trying to pile on the psychological pressure. But they didn't, they didn't use any thumb screws, it was quite good at that point. Anyway, they let me go free. Um, I was never charged with anything, but they kept me on what they call police bail, which means I kept having to go back to the police station to answer this bail for a period of about six months. And I went back to try and pack up the wreckage of our flat. And as I said, it was quite something. You know, it was completely ripped apart. But they'd also had a lot of fun. I mean, these were special branch officers, people I'd worked with and knew. Um, they'd even gone through my underwear drawer and things, you know, because they had good fun in, in there. It was quite freaky. During that time as well, they tried to pile on the pressure because it wasn't just me who was arrested. Uh, Shayla's brother was arrested too, two of his best friends in coordinated dawn raids um, on trumped up charges. And again, they were never charged with anything, but they were kept on police bail to try and keep Shayla under control, you know, some sort of leverage on him. Also during this case, we saw a number of um, supporters arrested and uh, hassled, and journalists. In some cases, they were charged and convicted because they dared to cover some of these stories. It was nutty, I mean, it's, you know, you're trying to get the truth out about criminality within the spy agencies, and it's all the people around you who get hauled through the courts. Anyway, after uh, packing up the flat, I decided to rejoin um, David in Europe, and at this point he'd holed up in a very remote little farmhouse, which had belonged to a friend of a friend. I was right in the middle of, um, of France, due south of Paris by about 200 miles, and it was very impressive. Of course, it was miles away from any shop. Um, we had to walk everywhere pretty much because we couldn't have a car because that would have been traceable. Um, <coughs> no heating, very little money. Um, it was very, very primitive. It's like going back to the 19th century. The only access we had to the outside world was a very uh, cumbersome laptop, but at least at that point we could watch some BBC news on it so we had a rough idea of what was going on in the outside world. And we stayed there for 10 months. And during that time, we tried to talk to the government, say, look, we've got all this evidence. Can you please take evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors going on in the spy agencies? Plus the fact, you know, we know they've got files on you. Aren't you a bit concerned about that? They didn't seem to like that. Anyway, the first newspaper reports had been about the lower level stuff, uh, things like files on government ministers, illegal phone taps, and what have you. The newspapers didn't have the balls to cover the Gaddafi plot initially. And David kept trying to get them to do this and also to pressurise the government to investigate this, to take the evidence and look at it. And they just refused. They strung us along. So after about 10 months in hiding, in desperation, he set up a website called uh, shayla.com, as it was. But if you look for it now, I think it's been turned into some Russian porn site. It's the way of all flesh. <laughs> at that time, it was, it was quite a good website. And he, of course, hosted it in America, because at that point, America still had a constitution and basic democratic rights. And the government actually had the gall to write to the California web server that was hosting it, uh, web company that was hosting it, and said, um, actually, there's an injunction against Mr. Shaler. Do you mind taking this down? 
think the California company just stuck two fingers up at them and said, uh, do you not remember 1776? You've got no jurisdiction in this country, fog off. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, that was America then, this is now, you know, probably wouldn't happen that way now. Anyway, so after 10 months, gets the website going, uh, begins to say he's going to put the Gaddafi plot details up there, and also goes back to the newspapers and said, right, come on, let's cover this now. You know, enough time's gone by, go with the story. So in uh, the end of July 1998, we got to Paris, we start meeting the journalists, we do the story, they've got all the details. And the British government decides after 10 months of ignoring us, that now is the time that we're on an urgent threat, and they issue an extradition request for Shayla to the French. And the French, of course, have to do this, they have to apply this. So we're staying in this Paris hotel. In fact, we moved hotels because, I don't know, our hackles were up, we thought something was wrong. Um, instinct, I suppose. And they still tracked us down. And um, he was hauled away and thrown into prison. And he was there for about four months, awaiting the extradition hearing. But for most of that time, he was banned <coughs> from seeing anybody but his lawyer. His family wasn't allowed to see him, I wasn't allowed to see him, because the British had lied to the French and said he was some traitor selling the secrets to an enemy power. Now, when the French got the paperwork, they realised all they were dealing with was a whistleblowing case. And the French, bless them, do not extradite people for whistleblowing. They say that it is manifestly a political action, and they're not going to extradite people for political, political actions. I think also they took great pleasure in pissing off the British government. <laughs> <laughs> the French indeed, yes. So, Shayla was then a free man. But he was stuck in France at that point, because if he even tried to go to any other European country, the British would have tried the same old trick, try and extradite him. And we couldn't guarantee that other countries at that point would necessarily um, uphold his freedom. So he spent another two years, literally, he was stuck in exile in, in France, um, holding up there in a lovely little flat. And so if you ever want to go on the run, go to Paris, it's beautiful. It's definitely a good place to live. And we took it as far as we could. I mean, we did a lot of campaigning while we were there. Um, and I used to spend most of my time going back and forth with Paris to London, trying to lobby the, the MPs and the journalists and deal with the lawyers and raise the profile of the case. And during this time, other information emerged, particularly around the Gaddafi plot. In, I think it was March 2000, a leaked document from MI6 appeared on the internet, and this proved the Gaddafi plot. I think it's still up there somewhere. It was mirrored all over sites like Crypto um, at the time. Basically saying that it had happened as, as uh, Shane had blown the whistle. So there was a huge, huge scandal in the British media at that time. Huge calls as well from them. Finally, they were saying to the government, look, we've got to have an inquiry. This, is, this looks like it's true. And this is murder on the part of MI6. And yet the government still managed to wriggle its way out of this. They managed to spin their way out. They said, oh, Shayla's a fantasist, you know, we don't know. We're not adding or subtracting from our previous comments about this case. He's just making it up. So there's still to this day never been an inquiry into murder by MI6. MI6 officers conspiring to commit murder and becoming state sponsors of terrorism. It's just quite astonishing. It's quite astonishing. And yet during this time as well, student activists, as I said, were would come over sometimes to interview David and things like that. And they go back and they would be arrested. There was one infamous case. There's a young woman called Julianne Davis who was sitting in her lecture theatre at university. And um, suddenly all these special branch officers appeared and hauled her out of the lecture theatre and charged her under the treachery laws in the UK. They, I think, thought she might have something to do with the Gaddafi plot um, document that appeared. I don't know. In their warped mind. Anyway, she's suing the arses off them for wrongful arrest at the moment going through the courts. So we took it as far as we could when we were in Paris. Uh, we had three years in total in France, but in 2000, later in 2000, we went back to the UK. And uh, Shayla knew that he would be put on trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act. But he wanted his day in court because at that point he thought it would be the only way he could get evidence about the Gaddafi plot and the other stuff out in the open in the court of law. And he was only ever charged with the very early stuff, you know, files on politicians, illegal phone taps. They never charged him, of course, with any of the more serious stuff. Talking about the Gaddafi plot, talking about the Israeli embassy, talking about the IRA bombs. Because they didn't want those ventilated in the courtroom. And you would have thought, well, okay, they're going to do that. Six months down the line, he'll be in the old bailey, in the dock, in front of a jury of his peers, and he will at least have his say. It didn't quite work out that way. It was over two years before he had his trial. And in those two years, the government ensured that he was locked down and locked down and locked down from what he could say and what he could do. 
in the courtroom. And they did a whole series of pre-trial hearings to gather the whistleblower. So when we finally got to the courtroom, we had a situation where he couldn't freely cross-examine his accusers. All his questions of the other MI5 officers, for example, were vetted by the prosecution and the judge and crossed out. Um, he was not allowed to say why we'd done what we'd done. And when it came to the verdict, the judge ordered the jury to convict, which is against all legal procedure in the UK. You have a right, the jury can say, well, okay, someone's guilty under the law, but in the interest of justice, we're going to say they're not guilty. It's called a reverse verdict. It's something that we've prided ourselves on in Britain for 300 years. People fought for that right, and it just got shredded in that case. So, of course, he was found guilty, and he was sentenced. He got six months, actually, in the end. But the worst thing, and this is something I think which is a, an enduring theme, is the supine nature of the media, certainly in the UK. Because the formal judgment at the end of the case said that um, he accepted that Shayla was acting in the public interest. The judge, this is the judge. He accepted it was public interest. He accepted there was no financial motivation. And he accepted that no lives had ever been put at risk by our whistleblowing. And, you know, all the journalists are sitting there writing it down. So, you know, look at the papers the next day, or the headlines, Shayla convicted. Shayla sells agent lives down the river for money. That's what the newspapers said. It was the entire opposite of what was said in the courtroom. <clears throat> I don't know how that, well, I do know how that, I don't know why the newspapers could be quite so perverse. I don't think it was the journalists, it's either the editors or, you know, writers or whatever. The government spin machine and the intelligence spin machine really kicked into action at that point. Now, the Labour government's been very, very notorious for its spin machine, you know, the dark arts, promulgated by a guy called Alistair Campbell, who was the sort of puppet master behind Tony Blair. But what's less well known is the control that the intelligence agencies have over the national media, mainstream media. There's a whole series of ways they can control it, where they invite journalists into this charm circle, where they get secret information, they get scoops, and where the editors are wined and dined by the heads of the agencies. And also where they have a self-regulatory body in the UK, which is made up of journalists who go native and start spreading the word for the spooks. The most vicious bit of the whole cycle is a section in MI6 called Information Operations, IOPS. And in this department, they specifically manipulate the media. They will plant false stories for their gain, for political gain. Or they will spin negative stories about the spies in order to make them sound more positive. So it's something to bear in mind again, you know, of course, never trust the mainstream media. But every time you see something about you know, terrorism legislation or wars or uh, intelligence or whatever, always wonder who's actually releasing that information, and who's spinning it, and how it's being spun. <coughs> anyway, um, that's my sort of personal background. I've become very involved in a number of um, campaigns and activism since then. I've also written a book, which I had to submit to MI5 for clearance to get it published. Because, of course, otherwise I would have been taken through the courts under the Official Secrets Act as a former intelligence officer. And I wrote it quite carefully, because, I mean, having worked on the inside, I knew what could really damage national security. I used to write stuff all the time, you know, that went out to governments and, uh, government ministries and things. So I knew it didn't damage national security, but it did tell it like it happened. And yet it took 15 months to vet the bloody thing. It just went on and on, all the way through the Iraq War and Dr. David Kelly's death and the Hutton Inquiry and the Butler Inquiry, all these sort of areas that I would love to have been able to contribute to as an informed commentator. Couldn't. I had to wait for this book to be cleared. And when it came back, they, take, they wanted only very few things taken out. So I left them in the book, of course, but blacked out so people would see I've been censored. And one of, the things, one of the things was just four little letters, which they objected to me including because they said it was a highly sensitive investigative technique. So I should break the Official Secrets Act tonight and tell you what it is. <coughs> CCTV. <laughs> Nobody had ever heard of that, of course. Especially in the UK, where we have over four million of things. We are the most surveyed society in Western Europe. Anyway, so that's, that's taken out of the book. Nice little black spot. So it's a bit of a sad story, really. Um, but I think, you know, you can draw themes out of it, which is the fact that the spies and the government can just ride roughshod over the laws of the land, where they're not held accountable, where they can get away literally with murder, and where there is no transparency. And of course the whistleblower always takes the ball for what goes on. But then of course we move on now to how those themes have just become macro, and it's something that Arya talked about earlier as well. Things like in the run-up to the Iraq war, where we saw fake intelligence being used to justify going into Iraq, 
You know, Tony Blair made the deal with George Bush to <coughs> deliver the UK into the Coalition of the Willing. So they had to fix the policy, uh, the intelligence and the facts around the policy, as the leaked down the street memo showed. And in this case, we're talking about fake intelligence. The MI6 said, yes, look, it's justification. Saddam Hussein is trying to buy uranium from Niger. No, he wasn't. That was a lie. Where weapons of mass destruction could be deployed by Saddam Hussein against the British within 45 minutes. That famous claim. 45 minutes from Armageddon with the national headlines across all the front pages of the papers. The day before our parliament took the vote of whether to go to war or not. No, I wonder why they voted yes. It's just crazy, the whole thing. And it's, again, the spies lying and getting away with it. There was no transparency. If it hadn't been for Dr. David Kelly, who paid the ultimate price, we would never have known that they sexed up the case for war. It's just crazy, it's just crazy. So where do we go from here? I mean, the spies are still getting away with it. They are literally getting away with murder. And they are doing worse and worse things. I mean, if you look now at what's going on, we've been taken into this nebulous war on terror, you know, this sort of faceless enemy. We never really know who's going to do what when. We've been taken into these illegal wars on their fake intelligence. And we're also looking at erosion of our freedoms as well, in the UK and across all Western democracies. And again, some of this was touched on in the previous talk. But as I said, I've been involved in a number of civil liberties campaigns recently, having seen on the inside quite how out of control these people can be. And it's frightening. I mean, we have in the UK people being locked up in prison <coughs> now with no charge, no evidence presented in the court against them, just on the say-so of junior, intel uh, junior intelligence officers in MI5 and MI6. This is internment without trial. For the first time ever in the UK's history outside a time of war, people just thrown into high-security prisons like Belmarsh because the spies say so. We're also looking as well at the UK airports being used for extraordinary rendition flights, where torture flights are landing and taking off. And I believe that happens in this country too. It's been proven. And again, Mozambique was mentioned in the last talk. This is a man who I had the pleasure of meeting last year. I went to interview him. Uh, and he's a British man. He's a Muslim. And he'd gone over to Pakistan with his wife and small child, who was two at the time, to help build a hospital. And he was snatched by the Americans. And he told me that he was in his flat with his family and the door just suddenly smashed in. And they hooded him, cuffed him, shackled him and dragged him off in front of his screaming wife and screaming daughter. And that was the last he saw of them for three years. He was held initially at Bagram Air Base where they tortured him. Uh, he was there for about 18 months. And he said as well, the worst thing about all of that was that there was a woman in the cell next door screaming and they kept telling him it was his wife. He said that was the worst thing. They, at that point, it didn't matter what they did to him. He just couldn't bear what they were doing to her. And then they transferred him over to Guantanamo Bay. We spent another 18 months. And he said he was relieved to get there because the conditions were so much better. I mean, how sick is that? And yet the worst thing as well, from my perspective, it sends, sends shivers down my spine, is the fact that many of the Guantanamo victims, the British ones, are now pursuing MI5 and MI6 through the courts in the UK because they're saying they heard British accents during the interrogations. They say that MI5 officers or MI6 officers were involved in those torture sessions. And I sort of think, God, are some of those people, I, you know, they could have been people I used to work with, people I would have counted as friends, gone out for drinks with, had dinner with. And I sort of wonder how they made that moral journey from being idealistic 20-somethings to people who would collude in torture and watch another human being suffer like that. I know I couldn't, and yet that seems to be going on. But we have a whole range of other things going wrong in the UK as well, because the spies get away with it, and because this fake perception of, of terrorism, this fear of terrorism, is being ramped up on a daily basis in the UK. The mainstream media colludes in this. We're looking at things like um, the holding of terrorist suspects when they're arrested. They hold them without charge for 28 days now. They want to up it to 42 days. They even wanted to up it to 90 days being held without charge while the police interrogate them. Now, as I said, I worked against the IRA in the 90s when they were putting bombs down pretty much at will. And at that point, you could hold a terrorist suspect for seven days and that was deemed to be enough. So why this extended period? Because they can. And we've had a whole slew of other legislation come in. Well, the other thing about the 28-day thing as well is um, 
our ex-commissioner of Metropolitan Police, Sir Ian Blair, who was the, the most senior police officer in the UK until very recently, he got boosted out of corruption, um, was caught lying to Parliament about the needs for extending the detention period to 42 days. He basically said, oh yes, we've had all these terror plots since uh, the London bombings in 2005. We foiled 12 of them. Uh, well, no, they haven't actually. There have been five. And this was established because someone blew the whistle on this from the intelligence agencies, to, I think, presumed to embarrass uh, Sir Ian Blair. But he was lying barefacedly for political and police gain in Parliament. He had to apologise for him unwittingly misleading. Of course, nobody ever lies in our Parliament. It's always unwittingly misleading the Parliamentary Committee. We've had a whole slew of other laws as well. We have something called the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, which has banned our freedom of expression in a kilometre radius around our House of Parliament, where you have to get prior written permission to protest against anything in the UK. And we also have laws like the Terrorism Act 2000. Section 44 has become notorious because this is used against everyone on the streets, particularly in London, and particularly activists and young men in the Muslim community, where that says you can be stopped and questioned and you can be arrested purely to ascertain your identity if you've refused to give you details. And this has been used, I think, about, there are 10,000 cases of this reported last year, mainly young male Muslims, but it's increasingly being used against activists who want to protest. And this, combined with the SOPA legislation, has really angered uh, young campaigners in the UK. In fact, of course, with the Gaza situation, there have been huge demonstrations in London over the last few weeks, uh, with about 100,000 demonstrating last weekend. Uh, weekend before last, in London. And I had friends on that demonstration who said they were actually corralled by the police and lined up in batches of ten. And then the police would go down that line with cameras and demand that they say who they were, what their name was, where they lived, all their identifying details were recorded. And if they didn't give those details, they'd be carried off and, and put under arrest. And this is for protesting genocide in the foreign country. It's just crazy. And there are other laws as well. I just want to run through how are we doing for time. A couple more. We have something as well that came in uh, in 2005 called the Civil Contingency Act, which sounds fairly benign, you know, it's there to protect us. And this effectively is something where government ministers can sign a document that declares a state of national emergency. And under that state of national emergency, they can uh, quarantine us, they can stop us moving freely around the UK, they can stop us having political meetings, um, they can even seize our homes and demolish them and not pay compensation. And then, well, this is all done in the name of national security, just to protect us. And the thing is, this law went in completely under the radar in 2005. Nobody in the media reported it. I know, believe me, I tried. All my articles got spiked. And nobody in Parliament objected to it. It was just whipped through. The whip system is a sort of parliamentary control mechanism. It's not literal. But there was pushed through Parliament. And nobody knows about it, even in the UK. And there was another one, final one, which really shows the intentions of where our government wants to go in the UK. And this is called the Regu uh, Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act. And that was passed in 2006. And it's not so bad now, but when the government proposed it in 2005, it became nicknamed the Abolition of Parliament Act, because under this, again, any government minister could just sign a document to abolish any previously passed law. So any law that had ever been passed by a House of Parliament in the last 700 years could just be overturned by a government minister <coughs> by signing a document. 700 years of democracy, well, almost, just gone. And there was an outcry, and that's why it was watered down. When it was passed, that provision was taken out. But that outcry did not come from the press. It didn't come from the MPs. It came from that well-known bastion of democracy, the House of Lords. <laughs> They're the ones that got rid of that provision. But we know that the government, again, is looking to... to to sort of change that act and update it and put something similar back in. So in the UK at least, we are looking at a situation where our rights are shredded, our traditional freedoms are gone, and we're all being treated as potential threats to the country. And we can be, you know, arrested with no reason. And it's quite frightening. And there is a beginning of resistance, shall we say, because the police are getting so heavy-handed in how they're applying some of these laws. But people are more concerned in the UK about... Um, getting fined for having their bins overfilled, for example, or for dropping litter on the street. But that, even that is beginning to make them feel that there's undue surveillance. They don't want to be part of that. There's another one as well, another law, called the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act that came in in 2000. And this was an update on how they could intercept our communications. 
This was to bring the old laws in, into line with the internet age. It took them a while to catch up. But this means that not only can the security services and customs and the police bug our phones and look at our uh, email traffic, up to 800, almost 800 public authorities can do so. And this goes right down to things like um, town councils can actually use these counter-terrorism laws to snoop on us. And they are doing so in record numbers in the UK. And that's angering people as well. There was a famous case last, uh, <coughs> yeah, last year where people who went to um, pick shellfish off a beach off the south coast of the UK were put under surveillance in case they were sort of poaching, they were rustling um, these shellfish. People are having their addresses checked up, their communications checked to ascertain if they live where they say they live or whether they're trying to get their children into a nice school. So that's just crazy. The whole thing has become almost like 1984, that book, The Distorted Vision. And people are beginning to tweak to this, but the movement, the sort of democratic fight back is very slow and quite old fashioned. So this is why I really wanted to come and talk to you tonight, the elite geeks. You don't realise quite, well I hope you do, quite how much power you have to help concerned citizens with their fight back. The security services particular, particularly are actually quite slow on the uptake when it comes to IT. Well you can probably gather that because I'm not using any and that's my background. They um, try to develop their own systems and never do, they always fail, they always just go wrong. So when I was there in 1996, they bought Windows 95 off the shelf to use as their admin um, system in MI5. And I heard recently that they're still using Windows and they just keep putting security patches on to keep it safe. <laughs> now putting aside the obvious hacking opportunity, it's not that I'd ever encourage anyone to do anything, it is a bit of an issue for our national security in the UK because there are all sorts of backdoor actors entrances on these sort of things. Why buy stuff from America that the Americans can have a sneaky beak through in an agency that's supposed to protect our country? But they're a bit slow on the uptake. You're probably getting that message now. So, um, you know, you are at the vanguard. You, you have this sort of knowledge and these skills that can really help other emerging social campaigns, civil liberties campaigns. The new wave, not the old sort of peace movement that's quite slow and bureaucratic and everything. But people who want to protest against things like SOCPA, against what's going on in the Middle East at the moment, you know, we, and they want to become their own media, and quite often they will film stuff and use videos and the whole thing just to spread the message. But they're not very good on using this internet effectively and securely as well. So please, you know, do get involved and spread your awareness, spread your knowledge, and help these people to on the fight back because I think things are probably getting just as bad in this country as they are in the UK. I just want to finish with um, a few lines from someone. And these lines were sent to me when Shayla was imprisoned in France. And it looked like he was going to be extradited and imprisoned in the UK. And someone sent me a letter. And they were just saying, you know, don't give up hope. And remember the words of a man called Pastor Martin Niemöller. I don't know how many of you have heard of these. Which start with uh, the lines of, it's from Nazi Germany, the build-up to Nazi Germany. Where he says, um, first they came for the communists and I was not a communist, so I did not speak up. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I was not a trade unionist, so I did not speak up. And then they came for the Jews, and I was not a Jew, so I did not speak up. And then they came for me, and there was no one there to speak up for me. So please do get involved and active in these social campaigns, as well as the hacking and the wonderful geek world. Thank you very much.
That's how it goes. Yeah. You, you cannot protest in the Netherlands without a permit, with no. more than one person. And getting well, a permit, yeah, getting getting a permit takes two weeks, and it can be refused without giving the reason for refusal. In the end, if if you walk on the street and hold up a leaflet, then you're demonstrating, and you are you can pay anyway. Yeah, that's happening a lot as well across the UK. Um, the police have been trying to stop people from handing out leaflets around these sort of campaigns, and they say, oh, it's about littering, you know, you're a public nuisance. In fact, there is still a right that says it's political or religious, you can still hand them out, you have that right. But, yeah, people are getting stuff knocked over, taken off of them, they're getting beaten up, just trying to push out this information. In um, the soccer zone around our parliament, uh, quite a lot of activists now do a one-man demonstration, so they don't need to get permission. So quite often they will, a group of people will go down and demonstrate about one aspect of the campaign they want to demonstrate about. So it's all different individually, but it, it's a bigger picture. And that's worked quite well, and it's quite fun to do as well. So that would be one approach. Um, when you were on the run, did you use any uh, fake information in the names and stuff? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were my fake names? Yeah. Uh, Richardson was one of them, Matheson was another, um, Dobby, <laughs> that was the, the someone that came later. Smith? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot easier to um, go on the run, though, say, we were talking a decade ago, so, you know, there was no CCTV. Um, the technology to intercept phone calls was so primitive that uh, if we rang in to one of our family members, for example, and their phones were blocked, they couldn't trace where the incoming call was coming from. They could only trace where the family members rang out. So they weren't allowed to, um, they were never allowed to ring us in our farmhouse. Although I think they blew our cover, and that's how they trapped us in the last month or so. Because um, David's brother got pissed one night <laughs> and decided he wanted to ring Dave up and say, How are you doing? I love you, bro. <laughs> um, that seems to be how they trapped us. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't have to piss up relatives if you're um, on the run. But no, it's quite easy because you know it's the obvious things. You don't use credit cards, you don't use the ATM machines, or if you do, you use it in the city and then you immediately leave that city and go to the far side of the country. Um, use fake ID. Yeah, it's pretty easy. It's pretty, pretty easy. Any other questions? Hmm. Yeah. How much do the movie scripts? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you'd be surprised. Um, we're not, yeah, nobody has been allowed to make a movie about this. Um, some people are, did approach us and wrote treatments and things. People with impeccable connections with things like BBC, Channel 4, what have you. Um, and they were always stopped. They were sort of crushed from a great height. And in fact, one guy who was a scriptwriter for some big films was actually told that if he did this story, he would never get any work in the UK again. He was frightened off. <laughs> That's quite amazing. Plus, the, the terms of the injunction that was taken out was so draconian that even works of fiction were banned. And letters were written to all the publishers in London saying, don't touch this, you'll be damaging national security if you publish it. And that's how draconian it was. You know, it's not just the overt laws, it's also the sort of connections from old school ties and things like that they use a lot. Mm. Any other questions? That will stunned you all into silence. Well, I'll be lovely around anyway. You can ask me private. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.